Hi, everyone. For our fourth episode, we have Carl Richards joining me today. Carl Richard is a certified financial planner and creator of the Sketch Guy column, appearing weekly in the New York Times since 2010. Carl also has been featured on Marketplace Money, Oprah.com, and Forbes.com. In addition, Carl has become a frequent, frequent keynote speaker at financial planning conferences and visual learning events around the world. Carl is known for utilizing simple sketches to make complex financial concepts easy to understand. His sketches serve as the foundation for his two books, The One-Page Financial Plan, A Simple Way to Be Smart About Your Money, and The Behavior Gap, Simple Ways to Stop Doing Dumb Things with Money. So Carl's commission work is on display in businesses and educational institutions across the globe. So Carl, thank you for joining me today. Thanks, John. Super excited to chat with you. Awesome. Great. So as always, I think it's always just best to start with a brief introduction of yourself for the audience. Yeah. So, I mean, other than that bio, I mean, I live, I live in the mountains in Utah. Um, we've got four kids and uh, have been really focused on helping people like really my work primarily is around helping people align their use of capital. And when I say capital, I mean, time, money, energy, and attention. So their use of capital with what's actually important to them. So that's been the focus of my work for the last two decades, really. Um, and that's, that's what led to the stuff on the bio, right? The books and the podcast, et cetera. So um, super fun to chat with you about it. Right. Awesome. So um, I'm interested, what was kind of your background before becoming a certified financial planner? Yeah, I, I got into the industry completely by accident. Um, I, I, I mean, I've told this story a bunch, but just I never tire of telling it. I, um, I went to apply during college. I was an undeclared major, so I really had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, my wife had recently graduated with a degree in finance and she was, I came home one day, she had a job, but I came home one day and she had opened the help wanted ads, the big, you know, fold out paper version. Mm -hmm. And um, she, I was like, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm looking for a job. And I said, well, you already have one. And she said, I know I'm looking for you. So it's like, well, what have you found? And she found what we both thought was a security job. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I went to apply for this. I thought it was like a bouncer or a mall cop or something. I thought this would be great. I'll work at, I'll work like at night and then I can still go to school full time. Mm -hmm. And, um, I got halfway through the interview and realized it wasn't, you know, they weren't asking me about my Kung Fu skills. Um, it turned out it was the ad said securities, right? right? So they were asking me about stocks and bonds and I didn't know really much about that stuff at all. Um, but somehow made it through the interview and, and got the job, which tells you obviously about the applicant pool. Um, but that's how I got into the industry was quite by accident. Um, and, but what kept me, what has kept me in the industry, speaking broadly, the sort of financial services, financial advice industry, speaking broadly, is just that it turns out it's not about the money, right? Like money is not about money and it sounds strange to say but it's about feelings and behavior and all of these things that work against us when we're making financial decisions it's not about calculators and spreadsheets it's about dreams and and fears and worries that's what's kept me in the industry is really the human piece of of money so that that's how i got into it and that's why i'm still here right and uh this is something that i've discussed with previous guests uh i feel like our financial perspectives uh can obviously differ from situation to situation. Um, but for the most part, it's ultimately what we see for ourselves in the long term. And so, you know, with you being a certified financial planner, what are kind of some of the obstacles that you see people face, um, you know, in achieving their financial goals? Yeah, I mean, it starts at the most basic level. And that is just, are, are you, are, are we, most of the time, our financial behavior like much of our, our eating behavior, like much of our other behaviors, it goes stimulus response. There's no space between those two. I feel like buying this thing, I buy this thing. And I think it starts by just simply being aware of our interaction with money. Like, can we just ask, well, why did you buy that thing? Why do you want to buy that thing? It just, can we, can we create just a little bit of space between the stimulus 
and the response, the desire to get the thing and getting the thing. And I, I by no means, like I'm a huge fan of spending money, like a huge fan. I think we should spend extravagantly on the things that we love and that bring us happiness. And we should cut ruthlessly on the things we don't. So I'm not saying stop spending the money. I'm just saying start noticing. And I think behavior change will be driven rather than like this punishment style, like I gotta keep a budget. I mean, nobody likes budgets. That that it's budgeting has a worse marketing problem than dentists do, right? Like it, it's not about that. What it's about is just simply starting to notice, make that behavior less automatic and become a little more intentional with how we use money because it turns out money is time, money is power, money is money's much more than this thing that we keep track of in zeros and ones in our bank accounts. So I think the biggest obstacle to meeting our financial goals is simply not being aware that we have the goals in the first place and then not taking the time to notice how our behavior is not getting us closer or further away from those goals. And then the last thing we do a lot of is we beat ourselves up around it. So I, I think just noticing without shame or blame, saying, oh gosh, isn't that interesting? I bought another pair of shoes today. Like, did I really need those? Do I really want those? Oh, you know what? Turns out I don't really need those. Okay, next time I won't do that, right? Like, it's not about shame or blame or beating ourselves up. So just simply noticing, establishing goals. And again, even goals are fuzzy because it's like, they're always guesses. So really the whole thing, we need to just give ourselves permission to relax a bit, right? Like relax around goals, relax around spending and just start noticing our behavior. And I think that will drive behavior change. Right. And I, I, I completely agree. Um, I believe that um, budgeting has definitely has like this negative connotation um, for the majority of people who may not be, you know, financially where they want. But I believe that there is significant opportunity cost in doing so. Um, you know, you'd be surprised with the, the savings that you have ultimately um, from budgeting and the opportunities that come with that, you know, um, saved up money. So but of course, it's a lot easier said than done. Um, and you know, budgeting is just one tool that we can utilize and implement for our financial strategies. Um, but I kind of wanted to get your take or perspective on some of the best ways to uh, stick to a regimen and essentially um, your uh, financial goal, like to limit yourself from spending and buying and really sticking to what you ultimately you know, see for yourself. And that's why we ultimately would implement these financial strategies. Yeah, I, so I, I think first, just even, even the, like, and I, I have to work really hard at this, like the language we use. So we don't need to limit ourselves, it turns out. We just need to decide what's really important, right? So instead of, like savings and investing is one way to use money. It can be seen as limiting ourselves in terms of consumption today, or it could be seen as getting ourselves closer to something that we want later. And so, and I'm not even sure that saving and investing is a good idea for some, like I have no idea. I, I know for me, some of the, the, the things that I derive the most, I mean, I just got done with a, a three week kind of camping trip in Baja, Mexico, surfing with my child, my daughter. It was irresponsible. Like almost every financial planner would tell me that was irresponsible and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Right. So, so I think if we just, first, if we just approach the language, like, like there's so much like pent up stress around having a goal and not meeting it, not sticking to a budget. Oh, I blew the budget again. Like all that language that we use. I think we just need to realize like that, it turns out that's part of being human. Having a goal and failing and bouncing around a bit, it's part of being human. You're going to fail. So I think if we just back off that language a bit and say, okay, well, so what should we do? What I think we should do is we, we guess at our goals. Like, where do I want to be three years from now? Like, this is an exercise all your listeners could go through. It's just guess. 
where do you think you want to be? And I like three years. Where do you think you want to be three years from now? Now, I promise you, you will be wrong about that. I promise you, you'll change your mind. But we have to have a stake in the ground and say, I want to head that direction. Because once we put a stake in the ground, and that could be like we, uh, I'll use our example here. Like we really want to pay off a huge piece of our mortgage in the next three years. That's an actual goal for us. We just did a remodel. We want to pay off the remodel. Um, so that's an actual goal. I think we could make a huge dent in it over the next three years. It's a guess. I think we can. If things go the way they've been going, I think we could. And I think that's important to me. And I think it's important to my wife. We've had this conversation. So we'll write that down. You know, we'll get specific, but let's just say, you know, pay off a huge chunk of, pay off the remodel, pay off remodel. We'll write that down. We'll get more specific about it. Pay off that remodel in the next three years, and we'll probably put the number in there even. We'll write it down. We'll stick it on a piece of paper. We'll put it in a drawer, and we won't spend much time obsessing about it. We'll just like, okay, great. That's a three-year goal. Well, so then, then I can say today, what are the behaviors that get me closer to that goal? Gosh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I need you know, new skis this season. No problem, right? Well, why? Well, because that other goal is a bigger yes. So it, instead of saying no to new skis, I'm saying yes to the other goal, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to say no. I don't like saying no. So I'm going to just say yes to the bigger goal. And then in terms of practical, like day-to-day -day things that I think is, I, 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 have, this, um, I have this SMS-based course that people can take called the spending practice. And practically what it looks like is just go by, like don't get all caught up in the app, what app, you know, which book to read, like just go get a stack of index cards or use Apple, use the notes app on your phone. Something super simple. Every time you spend, you use money, and try this for 21 days. Every time you use money, just make a note of it. No shame, no blame, no judgment. Don't try to change it. Just note, like you went into Jimmy John's, you bought the number, number 10 Unwitch, it was $8.97. Just write down, isn't that interesting? Jimmy John's Unwitch, $8.97. That alone, I think you start to build the muscle because mm -hmm. we fail so often at this. And the only reason, the only way to not fail is to just practice. It's practice. It's not like there's no, nobody's going to die. Just practice paying attention to the money. And then every once in a while revisiting, where am I headed? Oh yeah, that's right. I want to pay off. The, I want to pay off the remodel in the next three years. Okay, cool. That serves as a, that goal gives you gravitational pull, which I really like. And it gives you a bigger yes. But to me, that's the simplest way. And the day-to-day -day habit is every time you use money, write it down. What did you use it for? No shame, no blame. Just write it down. And I'm telling you things will change. Your behaviors will change. Right? That's the easy way to think about budgeting. Mm -hmm. Right. And I completely agree. And I think um, one of the key words we can uh, kind of emphasize here is acknowledgement. And pretty much uh, just, it, it, it takes consistent effort in anything, um, especially something worth achieving. Um, but it is a lot harder said than done. And I believe that it's the small things that compound, you know, over a couple of weeks, a couple of months, maybe even a year that will ultimately lead us to uh, these habits. And, you know, in this case, these habits would be to recognize and acknowledge our financial situation so that we can better position ourselves in the long run. Um, but you, you did just mention that, you know, you have a, you have a daughter. Uh, how old is she? So we have four, four kids, three daughters. The daughter that I was on the surfing trip with is 23. Okay. So the reason why I ask is because I'm, I'm, I'm interested in hearing your approach to how you, um, you know, mentioned or brought up the concept uh, of money and um, essentially how you, um, wanted to uh how, essentially how you wanted your kids to know and be raised um about money and like their financial awareness 
Yeah, I, we didn't do a great job at that, Jonathan. I, would, I wish we would have done better. Um, but what we did finally catch on to at the end, I mean, at the end, they're not, they're not dead yet, but like, like, they're, they're like three of them are out of the house. Um, they're all doing fine. But what we finally caught on to near the end is like, we got to talk about this more. It's unbelievable. I, I remember when my son was eight or nine and the neighbors got a new boat or something. And my son said, oh, they must, we drove by. He's like, oh, the neighbors got a new boat. They must be rich. And I remember hearing myself say, his name's Sam. I remember hearing myself say, hey, Sam, that's none of our business. And immediately I was like, is that the message we want to send? around like if i bring up money sex politics or religion uh, like the message is we're not it's not safe to talk about um and so we that started this sort of change of like no let's talk more about it let's talk more about let's involve the kids if we if i was doing it over again i would i would like each kid when they turn 16 i would have them take over the family budget for two months so they would know everything i'd have them log into the bank accounts i'd have them see my salary I'd have them pay the bills. I'd have them basically, you're going to run the family finances for two months. That's an idea I just read about in a, a book called Paddling My Own Canoe. I can't remember who the author was. It's a great idea. Oh, no, I can't do that. My kids would then know how much money we make. Yeah, exactly. Right? I love that idea. Another idea out of Ron Lieber's book, which um, Ron's book was called um, The Opposite of Spoiled. He told this story about a guy who grew up in a family where you weren't allowed to talk about money like most of us did so we don't talk about money the only time we talk about money is when there is none like he grew up in that and he was like i want to change that so on his way home from work one day he went to the bank and he got out his whole month's salary in cash right so like he, he and he brought it home and i can't remember if it was in one i think it was in hundreds and he brought it home and he stacked it on the table his whole month's salary and his wife was like, what are you doing? And the kids, he had six kids. His kids all came home from school and they gathered around the table and he took out a, like a yardstick and he was like, boom. And he cut off like, here's what we pay in taxes, right? And then he divided up what they tithe to their church. They give 10% to their church. Boom, here's, what we, here's our mortgage. Here's our utility bills. He divided it up into piles. And then like the kids could see like, oh my gosh, look what's left at the end. You know, the conversations they had about money after that, amazing, right? And I think we all get so scared to do those sorts of things because we're nervous what the kids will think. So if, if I were doing it again, I would err on the side of more transparency with my kids. More and more questions like, do you really want that? What is it that you're hoping buying that thing will provide for you? right? More of those sorts of questions, more questions around awareness and less fear. And if they end up telling the neighbor's kids that we make X, so what, right? So what? The neighbor's kids will think they're lying anyway. If the kids mention it to their parents, they'll be like, nobody talks about money. They won't even, like, it won't matter. But our kids, your kids, would get the chance to learn about this thing that we're not allowed to talk about. So that, that's one thing I would do differently this, if I had a chance to do it again. So from your perspective, I kind of wanted to you know, get your take on financial curriculum and essentially what we can do to, uh, to amplify um, this situation, which is you know, financial literacy in the US. <clears throat> yeah, I, look, I agree that there's a problem. I agree that personal finance largely is, there's a systemic problem to the way we handle money that, that, that individual efforts only go so far, right? And, and, and it's a bummer, um, you know, it's trying not to be a, cons like trying not to spend too much money in our society is real. it's like showing up to a, gunfight with a knife like it's it, it's hard <laughs> right so i get all that and i think there are things that could be done and i was kind of excited my my daughter my 17 year old daughter just told me that everybody in high school at least in our district i don't know if it's statewide in utah 
have to take a personal client, a personal, a financial literacy course, which is great. Um, so I think there's more we can do for sure. And at the same time, I don't spend much time thinking. I spent a big chunk of my career thinking about this and realized I'm going to focus more on what I can control. Right. And, and what I can control individually is my individual choices, even though it's hard, it's like showing up to a gunfight with a knife. Like I, 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 I just got to get better with a knife. I, the analogy is going to, we're going to lose the analogy a bit, right? But, but I just got to get better using a knife. And, and so I think we're sort of, we're, we sort of have to work on both fronts. Like what can we do publicly? What can we do to help financial literacy? Can we go teach a class? Like I, I taught a budgeting class. Um, I've taught a couple of community-based budgeting classes and they always seem to help. If you know how to budget, can you go teach a class, right? Can you go support the teacher at the local high school that's trying to teach a personal finance course and doesn't have the resources because they're so strapped and so busy? Can you help them? Like, what can you do to help? Um, I think that's all we can do. And then get really good to ourselves. And I always think of it as an expanding circle too. Like, what can I do to get decent at this myself? What can I do to help my kids get decent at it? How can that expand just a little bit to my community and my friends? So that, that's all I've got there. I, there's some really cool things going on technology wise to help with financial literacy. And I'm a big fan of those efforts. Right. Right. So I, I definitely agree that there is progress being made um, within the direction of, you know, curriculum in the U S um, so it's definitely um, something positive, but also, uh, you know, it's, it's the con constant effort in, uh, promoting, you know, the awareness of financial literacy, that's pr pretty much essentially going to drive us to where we want to, where we want to be at. Um, and for me, you know, that, that could differ for many people, but for me, um, I think that the goal is to have all 50 states in the U S implement some sort of, uh, financial curriculum, um, specifically personal finance. Um, and then, you know, a variety of other topics that can be discussed. Um, so I did, I, I did want to move on to um, your books. I just wanted to cover and kind of discuss your books. Um, so the one page financial plan, um, I wanted to discuss this book. It kind of covers um, your current situation and pretty much steps to achieving the financial goals you may have. Um, but I'm particularly interested in this one page financial plan. So could you kind of just give us an explanation of what exactly the one page financial plan is? Yeah, so financial plans have a tendency to be very, very long, use a bunch of words that no, none of us understand, and we don't, like, the re there's a reason they tend to gather dust up on the bookshelf. Um, and I saw that after doing hundreds and hundreds of them for clients. And so I always have this goal of working really hard to send people less. Like, how can we narrow down? How can we get more focused? And so I started toying around with this idea of like, could I get a financial plan to one page? And it was really for myself. Like I had to have a way to remind myself of the things that were really important when it comes to money. Um, when I was thinking about doing something stupid, which is often for me. So I just one day took out a Sharpie and a piece of cardstock and I wrote on the top of it, I wrote a, a statement of why. I now think of it as a statement of financial purpose. So that's what goes on the top of a one page plan. Is a statement of financial purpose. It's just a sentence or two. For me, it says time with my family, mainly outside, and serving in my community and my church. That's what the top says. That's why I'm doing this. That's why we have money. There's no other reason. There's literally no other reason for me. Time with my family, mainly outside, and serving in my community and my church. That's the reason we have money. Um, of course, that that means health and taking care of our, taking care of extended family and helping in the community, but serving in my community and church covers that. So um, I wrote that down on the top. And then I just wrote down a couple of goals. Like what are the things we're working on now, right? Not a long list, it was like three or four goals. What are the things we're working on now? And often I think of that as I rank them in order of importance. So like right now, when we redo that one page, and this, this plan is meant to be redone often, 
right? When we redo that one page, the top will probably still be the same. Time with my family, mainly outside, serving my community and church. But the goal we're working on, we already mentioned it. Like we wanna pay off the, the expense we took on in remodeling our house. Cool, that's our three-year goal, right? So that's the next step. So statement of financial purpose, goal, and then, and this, the goal should come out of the statement of financial purpose. I can only spend time with my family, mainly outside, and serve in my community and church if I have some, fi- I have some flexibility with my time. Well, one way to get by that flexibility with my time is to get the remodel paid off, right? So it, 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 the goals are flowing out of the statement of purpose. And then the next step is the next, the next section of a one-page plan is just, I think of it as next 90 days. We typically call it next, or we typically call it action steps. What am I gonna do in the next 90 days to make progress, right? And that will be updated. And I, I love checking those things off, putting a line through them and leaving them there and then adding new ones. What am I gonna do 90 days from now when we've, we've done this? Well, okay, how about tomorrow, you know, I'm gonna go in today to our banking account and our automatic payment to our mortgage, I'm gonna increase it by hundred bucks. Okay, well that's a good step, right? Okay, great, that's gonna happen automatically now. So I don't have to think about it next month or the next month or the next month. And that will help me make progress towards paying down the, the debt we took on to do our remodel, right? So that's how I would think about it. And that's meant to be a living, breathing document. Something you, you know, you could stick it on the fridge, it could be in the bedroom, like wherever, you see it often. It reminds you of why you're doing the work you're doing. So that's how I think of a one-page financial plan. Right, and I, I think that's I think that's a great approach. You know, oftentimes I think um, a lot of what what we could say financial advice or books on financial planning and things of that nature can, you know, have a lot of information. But most, of, I, I would I would assume that. Um, the majority of the time that they're kind of fluffed words or words that, you know, really wouldn't stick to the average, the average individual. So I think kind of dumbing it down and really just highlighting the key, key topics and purposes and, you know, goals in mind um, is essentially all that really needs to be, uh, needs to be done to, you know, essentially focus on uh, your financial strategy. So um, I think, I think that is very interesting as well. Um, And now, so very quickly, I wanted to discuss um, the behavior gap. Um, this, this book essentially covers or explores being smart about your money and evaluating emotional responses to certain financial decisions. Um, and is this the book that you're kind of known for, for the illustration? Yeah, I think that was the first book. And um, those illustrations, I've been doing those for... Um, yeah, very, a very long time. And so he, both of the books have a lot of the sketches in them. Um, but yeah, that was the first book and that, that sketch on the front is one of the more popular ones. Mm-hmm. So yeah, could you, um, so the behavior gap, this is pretty much like emotional responses and kind of evaluating um, your current situation. What do you feel is kind of the, the biggest takeaway from this book that people can, t- uh, you know, essentially get? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty simple money success with money is about behavior not about math and if we can just understand that and you know this this goes from spending saving certainly investing absolutely like you can build the best portfolio ever created ever 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 and if you get scared out of it one time a year you may as well have your money under a mattress under your mattress so it's investment skill, sorry, investment success is not about skill, it's about behavior. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the takeaway from the book. Right, and um, I definitely do think um, the majority of personal finance comes down to uh, discipline. And discipline, like anything else, is something, it's a skill set, it's a skill that we all have to work on. And eventually, you know, they, these skill sets get in height or we strengthen these skill sets, you know, but it takes, it definitely takes time and effort and consistency in doing so. Um, so we are near the end of our timer. Um, do you have any last remarks? Uh, I understand that you have a website where we can check out uh, more information and in your books at. Yeah. I mean, I think the easiest way, John, for people to follow the work I do is to go to behaviorgap.com and get our uh, weekly newsletter. 
So I, I've been sending out a weekly letter for, I don't know, over, I think over a decade now, every single week. And I work super, super hard to make it as short as possible. So it's typically a sketch and a few hundred words. My goal is that it will take, take you five minutes to read, but you'll be thinking about it all week. So if you just go to behaviorgap.com, that's the easiest way. And of course, you can always follow me on Twitter. Um, so yeah, and, and let me just wrap with just saying, look, uh, thanks for the work that you're doing. I think the more we talk about this, the more um, we sort of try to get our heads around what it means to be, to align our use of money, time, energy, and attention, our use of capital with what we say is important to us. That's a never ending process. It won't finish. That process will not finish until we die, right? Like we're just continually refining. And if we can remember that, that financial planning, financial literacy, life planning, goals, building a business, it's not about being right today. It's about being less wrong tomorrow. And if we can just get comfortable living in that space, I think we have a chance. And um, if we don't, we're just sort of continuing to play this little game that we like cute little stories we tell ourselves about how we're, we're, we have this budget and this goal. And you now it turns out that we're humans things get messy. Let's get comfortable with that messiness and just do our best each day to get closer and closer to the lives we're trying to live. So that's, that's how I would wrap, John. Right. Well, I think that was fantastic. And you provided, you know, exceptional uh, insight. And, you know, you've been in this industry for quite some time. So thank you again for joining me. I would like to keep in touch. And um, I definitely look forward to this newsletter. Um, you know, you've been doing that for so long as well. Uh, is there anything else that we can expect, you know, any other, any other projects or something in the works that we can look forward to? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a new book that I'm working on, but that's not going to be for at least another year and a half. Um, it'll be called dancing with dragons, but we're not telling anybody that yet. So, Got it. so uh, you can look forward to that. Super excited about it. Awesome. Well, I definitely want to circle back when, you know, that date's coming near. Um, but thanks again, Carl. I, I found this incredibly insightful. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, cheers, John. Thank you. Bye.